6, je trouve. Navi, bonsoir, enfin bonjour plutôt. Bonsoir et bonsoir. I will now uh, switch to English because I think you will be speaking in English, right? Yes. Okay, Navi, um, it's such a great pleasure to see you here on screen. I'm sorry you can't see the room uh, and you can't see the blue sky of Marrakesh, but I guess the sky is also blue in <laughs> Palo Alto. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> That's great. Um, so, Navi Raju, um, and I am now speaking to the audience here. Um, Navi Raju has made a great honor uh, to be part of Africa for Tech board, and he was the first one to actually say yes when Gilles and I started to have a discussion about it. So Navi uh, is very, a very dear uh, board member and strategist for Africa for Tech. He is an Indian-born French national, but he's an innovation and leadership strategist based uh, in the Valley. He's a fellow at Judge Business School, um, University of Cam Cambridge, and he has served on the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council on Design Innovation and contributed to Harvard Business Review Online. Navi won the 2013 Stinker 50 Innovation Award and he's a TED speaker for TED Global 2014. He is ranked as one of the 50 most influential persons shaping innovation in France, but he's mostly known as co-author of the book um, about, and the concept, I would say, and the inventor and the father of the concept of Jugad Innovation, whose book, Frugal Innovation, How to Do More with Less, won the CMI Management Book of the Year in 2016. So, Navi, uh, we are all with you. We're very happy to hear you and to see you. Uh, and I will now let you speak. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Navi. Uh, I, uh, I'm hoping that uh, technology works out well. Uh, you know, being in Silicon Valley, we are over optimistic about technology, but Hopefully uh, it all works out well and you can hear me properly. And uh, so if there's any issue, uh, you know, you can let me know. Um, so again, I'm delighted to be here uh, virtually with you. I uh, wish I could be uh, physically with you. Uh, Morocco and particularly Marrakech is uh, one of my favorite cities in the world, but uh, unfortunately I'm currently busy writing my next book. Um, so I couldn't travel uh, all the way to uh, Morocco, but I'm delighted to be here virtually with you. Um, to discuss about um, a very important topic that I think will uh, help kind of guide your reflection and even as you in, uh, participate in a boot camp to really think in a kind of a, a broader global way. Uh, and that's why the, the title of the presentation, uh, in a moment you will begin to see the slides coming up, uh, is the fact that we are entering a new age of uh, convergence where uh, problems are such as climate change or healthcare or energy issues uh, are beginning to converge around the world. So what it means is that uh, even though uh, here in your event, you'll be talking about how do we uh, come up with uh, solutions much more adapted to the African uh, you know, uh, reality, um, we need to start thinking more and more uh, as global citizens. And, and this is where I believe that the concept of uh, frugal innovation becomes very powerful because the kind of solutions we'll be developing over the next couple of days could be uh, affordable, accessible, sustainable, and of high quality. And if they could be very relevant and applicable in the African context, I would claim that they could be relevant globally as well. But for that to happen, uh, we need to first develop a global consciousness and realize that, uh, you know, while it's important to think and feel like Africans or as, as Indian or American or French, we need to go beyond that. We need to transcend our national identity and start adopting a global identity because the kind of problem we are facing, these problems without borders, requires us to develop a global consciousness. So with that as a kind of uh, backdrop, uh, what I want to do in the next 20 minutes 
is to take you over, uh, you know, a kind of a, almost like a course of history uh, to show how in the last 20 years, amazing things have happened in the world of innovation. And the very fact that we are having a conference, Africa for Tech, is highly symbolic. It's a turning point in global history where for almost several centuries, innovation used to happen primarily in the West, like in Silicon Valley. And now innovation is becoming much more globally distributed. And I would argue that maybe the next kind of, you know, a major hub of innovation will become Africa. And, uh, and as Africa develops its innovation capabilities, I want to show how it can integrate better with the rest of the world. So can we uh, bring up the slides, please? Um, so as I said, the, the, the theme of my presentation is uh, about, you know, this concept of problems without borders and how we can solve these problems using frugal solutions. Next. And I apologize for the audience, but uh, this is my way of telling the technical staff to keep moving the slides and you will keep hearing next, you know, uh, several times. So uh, this slide essentially shows uh, the trajectory of global innovation. So essentially to help you understand this picture, what I try to do here is to show how innovation has a life cycle where, you know, it's inspired by the needs of the market and then somebody develops the solution and then eventually it's marketed. Next. So you see for a long time, what happened is that innovation happened primarily in advanced economies, you know, United States and Europe, because the affluent middle class lived in Europe and America, and they gave the inspiration for new products and services. So R&D uh, engineers and scientists were primarily located in US and Europe where they developed the solution and they marketed it, you know, uh, in Western world. Next. And then once they developed the technology, uh, let's say in, uh, you know, in Silicon Valley or uh, in Paris, the solution was then exported, you know, to uh, the emerging economies. And also these solutions used to be an older generation of technology and very rarely, you know, the latest technology. Next. And then in the 90s, something amazing happened. And this is called the outsourcing phenomenon, whereby Western companies, uh, you know, French, British, American companies, begin to outsource some of the R&D activity to emerging markets like India and China, particularly because they found very cheap labor there. Uh, so the idea was, uh, you know, to take, you know, uh, uh, inspiration from, uh, you know, the Western world but then go to India and China to develop a cheap solution, uh, not cheap, but use cheap labor to create a solution and then eventually bring it back to the Western market. Next. Next. So you can see, right, this is the trajectory that happened, you know, until the 90s. Uh, essentially, it's called, you know, labor arbitrage. That means you take advantage of the cheap labor, R&D labor in India and China to develop the solution, but they acted more like a back office, you know, to the innovation uh, value chain, which remained concentrated in the Western world. Next. And then in the 2000s, something amazing began to happen where the whole innovation value chain begin to be localized in, you know, emerging markets like India, China, but also in Africa and South America. Next. That means that essentially, you know, every aspect of the product development took place in emerging economies for the first time, you know, in modern history. Next. So this led to what we call, you know, local indigenous innovations that are 100% developed in emerging markets, like the $2,000 nano car developed in India on the left, or uh, amazing uh, mobile solutions coming out from Africa, like uh, Ushahidi uh, or M-Pesa, which, you know, everybody is familiar with. This is kind of, you know, a first time, I would say, in, you know, in the history of Global South, that we begin to show to the world that, you know, emerging markets were able to create, you know, these, uh, you know, amazing solutions. Next. 
So in the process, what happened is that as local companies begin to come up with uh, you know, innovative solutions, uh, the middle class in Africa, India, China began to grow as well. So as a result, multinationals started opening R&D labs in emerging markets so they can create solutions that are tailored, adapted to the local needs. So this is an example of Xerox, the famous Xerox, uh, you know, I live here in Silicon Valley, they have this firm called Xerox Park, which is a famous R&D lab from which, you know, uh, the legend says that Bill Gates and Steve Jobs stole a lot of ideas from there. So that was the, you know, the, the, the initial lab that Xerox set up was in Silicon Valley. And then in 2010, they opened the first ever uh, R&D lab in emerging market in, uh, in India. And I was, uh, you know, pleased to be there with their CTO, uh, Sophie Vanderbrock, at the inauguration. And Africa also, next, uh, Africa also began to, uh, you know, uh, be home to R&D labs. Like Orange, for example, the French telecom operator, opened one of their Orange labs in Cairo, Egypt, in 2008. That's one of their, you know, 18 or so uh, labs worldwide. So you can see that multinationals also begin to localize the innovation value chains in emerging markets. Next. So in the process, as uh, more and more uh, innovation begin to emerge from Africa, India, and China, we begin to think about a different model, a different paradigm of innovation. Uh, and this new model of innovation came to be known in the last six years as frugal innovation. So what is frugal innovation is the idea that, you know, unlike in the West, we invest a lot of money to come up with very sophisticated, expensive technology solutions. Emerging markets is showing that it's possible to do more with less. That is essentially to create uh, more value using fewer resources. And I put the, you know, the in parentheses values because it's not just about economic value, but it's about other kinds of value. Next. So what, next. Essentially, the other values are social and environmental value. And this is very important. That means that frugal innovation is not about something cheap, but it's about delivering greater value uh, economically, socially, and environmentally as well. Next. And do so in a way that makes the most of the limited scarce resources they have, whether it's financial resources, capital, or natural resources like water or time, because time also is scarce because you know you have so many problems, big challenges. So you need to like the boot camp, right? You have to create solutions very fast. So time is a scarce resource. So you need to learn to minimize it and generate greater value. So this is the kind of idea, right? About doing more and better with less is the essence of frugal innovation. Next. So several books have been published in the last couple of decades, a couple of years, uh, kind of praising the frugal innovation uh, coming out of the emerging markets. Uh, I wrote this book with my co-authors, uh, Jugad Innovation on the left. In the middle is a book, uh, Dragons at Your Door, by Professor Peter Williamson, uh, who is an expert on China. And now we are talking more about innovation and the innovation kind of the model and mindset of the Chinese. Uh, and then um, in the last three, four years, interestingly, uh, there are several books coming out, uh, you know, praising the innovation spirit of uh, Africa. And uh, this one is one of my favorite one, uh, The Bright Continent, uh, published by a CNN reporter uh, who is a Nigerian-American, uh, Dayo Olopade, uh, who actually talks about, you know, like Jugad, I think she calls it the Kenju, which is essentially a, a Nigerian term, which is the kind of, you know, uh, make do a frugal, ingenious mindset of the African continent. Um, so you can see that, you know, frugal innovation is now suddenly becoming, you know, celebrated, you know, worldwide. Next. And a couple of quick kind of, uh, you know, uh, new uh, you know, insights into why frugal innovation is very different than uh, the kind of the, the Western model innovation, because frugal innovation is all about including people, right? It's not elitist. It's more about democratizing innovation, making it more accessible to more people. So this is a solution from uh, uh, China. Uh, China has a big problem because in 2050, uh, 
500 million Chinese people will be seen as citizens. So the, there's an aging population in China, and many of them live in rural areas. So the Chinese government realized that they cannot set up hospitals and uh, train doctors fast enough to deal with this aging population, which suffers from chronic diseases like uh, diabetes or uh, you know cardiovascular diseases. So um, a company called NewSoft, which is uh, China's uh, largest IT service company, came up with this uh, telemedicine solution, which allows doctors in a city to remotely consult elderly patients in villages. And then they train these uh, local people like nurses to operate these easy to use devices that can collect data from local patients and beam that into a cloud computing infrastructure so, and then have a doctor remotely analyze it and give diagnosis and, you know, and advice. So, so you can see that true innovation is something that tries to include everybody by coming up with you know, easy to use affordable solutions like in healthcare. Next. And frugal innovation is also disruptive. And this is important because, see, if Africa wants to be known as a global hub of innovation, you have to use the term disruptive because that's the only term the West understands. And I know it's funny, but it's serious because, see, the thing is that we have to prove to the West, you know, I say we because, you know, I come from the global South, and we have to show to the West that, you know, the kind of solution that we are developing in Africa are leapfrogging. Uh, you know, what we have done in the West. Uh, for example, M-Pesa, right? I always use this, you know, in my presentation uh, in the US and, uh, and Europe is because it shows how it's possible Africa as a continent is leapfrogging from no banking to mobile banking straight. They will never have, you know, bank branches like in Paris or in New York. They go straight. The bank is the phone. Uh, and not only that, you know that with M-Copa, uh, Africa is also leapfrogging from, you know, candlelight to solar light, straight. Um, and uh, next slide. And uh, this actually, you know, is an article that proves my point that was published in Business Week, uh, Bloomberg now. Uh, a couple, uh, two, three years ago, uh, there was a reporter from New York uh, who went to Kenya and he spent 10 years in, uh, in entire Kenya, not just Nairobi. He went on safari as well, et cetera. And his, uh, his, uh, his uh, challenge was to use no cash. He only had to use M-Pesa and he does that. And then when he returns to New York, uh, his article concludes by saying that he felt like a caveman who has been handed a big lighter. Now, this is coming from an American, <laughs> you know, in New York, the most sophisticated, you know, city in the world, who says that actually, you know, he felt he was having much more a modern life in, you know, in uh, Kenya than in New York. So you can see how indeed Africa is capable of pioneering really disruptive innovation that also happens to be, you know, affordable, accessible, and of high quality. Next. So of course, you know, when we think about frugal innovation, you know, you know, in Silicon Valley or in Paris, you know, London, people ask me like, yeah, but that's all fine. But you guys, you know, just use, you know, uh, existing telecom infrastructure to come up with M-Pesa. That's not really cutting edge stuff. What about, you know, science, you know, like uh, sending a man to the moon? Um, I would answer to that by saying, forget about sending a man to the moon. Let's go beyond that. Let's talk about Mars. Um, so, you know, in September last year, um, the NASA, the US Space Agency, sent a mission to Mars called MAVEN at a cost of $670 million of taxpayers' money, my money. Uh, and, um, and then it took them five years to develop this project. Um, next. That same week, another uh, spacecraft entered Mars orbit. It's called Mangalian, which was developed by the Indian Space Agency, which was developed for the cost of only $74 million one-tenth of the budget of NASA, and three times faster. How they did that? Simply because instead of building physical prototypes like uh, the NASA did, India, which is known for the software capabilities, did a lot of simulation work in software. So they saved a lot of money that way. Um, and this shows that you can even do what we call frugal science, uh, which is do space exploration in a frugal way. And uh, by the way, the movie uh, Gravity with uh, Sandra Bullock and George Clooney cost $100 million. So while Hollywood explores space in fiction, India can do that in reality much cheaper. 
So that is the power of you know, Google Science. Next. So what this example of uh, you know, the, the, the space exploration shows is that you know, what I mean by disturbed innovation is if I go back to the framework, the definition of frugal innovation, it's about doing 10x, 10x. So I hope that in the bootcamp, think that way, which is, can I disrupt, can I come up with a solution that delivers 10 times more value using at least 10 times fewer resources, right? That's how you can call something really frugal because then it really disrupts the status quo uh, in the marketplace. Next. So what is interesting now is that uh, the West is beginning to take in note of the frugal innovation phenomenon in emerging markets. And uh, being uh, you know, an Indian uh, you know, uh, person, I you know, never believed in my life I would see a report published by a British uh, think tank with this title, which is uh, Our Frugal Future, Lessons from India's Innovation System, which is an amazing title, as you can imagine. So essentially, Nesta is the leading British think tank that advises the British government on innovation policies. And they published this report to show that the UK has to learn from India in how to do more with less. And this essentially, uh, you know, uh, forebodes a, a major trend. Next slide. Which is called reverse innovation, uh, which is the idea that more and more uh, solutions initially developed in the South find their way to the North. Next. So that means that initially we create something exclusively for Africa, and then it will find its way next to the advanced economies. Next. So two examples of that, of reverse innovation. On the top left is an electrocardiogram device, ECG device, medical device developed by General Electric, G. Uh, this is called MAC 400, developed in India. Uh, it cost uh, one-tenth 10% of the cost of you know, uh, ECG devices uh, sold in the West, and the weight is one-fifth. That means that it's a portable now. You don't need to go to the hospital to get an ECG you know, uh, 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 graph. Uh, the doctor can carry it you know, in the bag and go see a patient and immediately get an ECG you know, uh, you know, a read. So this solution, uh, initially developed in India, is now being sold in America as well. And similarly, Orange Money is another good example, right? Orange actually initially tested it uh, you know, in a large scale in Africa, very successful. And then in September this year, they have started introducing the solution in France and potentially you know, in uh, Eastern Europe and the rest of the Europe as well. So these are two examples of reverse innovation. Solutions are uh, initially developed uh, frugally in the South and, and finding their way to the North. Next. Now, having said all this, what I want to wrap up with is, uh, you know, kind of, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, being very modest here and uh, understand that uh, it's very possible that Africa will become an innovation superpower. Um, but the question is, what does it mean? Is this something that we should be very proud about? Of course we should be. But it, we shouldn't think that Africa becoming an innovation superpower means that we are better than anyone else. Because the notion of I am better than you, or you, know, you, you are you know, less good than me makes no sense in an increasingly interdependent world. Next. So as the cartoon shows here, we are all in the same boat. And uh, this is what I want to really kind of talk about and uh, conclude, is that I really believe that we are entering a brave new world Next, which I call the age of convergence. That means that increasingly, we have problems that have no borders. Let me give you an example. I grew up in India in the 70s where water was rationed. I used to take a shower with one bucket of water twice a week. Uh, and now I live in California where we have water shortage. So I also take today, you know, a 50 second shower <laughs> every day because water is, you know, also getting scarce. So you see that suddenly water is a problem that affects many countries in the world, whether they are rich, poor, white, black, brown, it doesn't matter. Everybody's affected by water, right? So that's what I mean by problem without borders. Next. 
and water is something I'm really obsessed about because this picture shows that if you take all the water in the world, including oceans, and you put it in a cube, this is, what, this is how much we have left. And out of that, you can see that the fresh water is that little tiny drop. That's all we have for 7 billion people. So imagine we have 10 billion people in 2050. You can imagine how much pressure that's going to put on our ability and on our, on our natural resources like water. So this will affect, of course, uh, fundamental things like how we feed ourselves. So agriculture and farming is going to be severely impacted by this. I read recently that uh, due to climate change, uh, Africa may lose 15 to 20% of its uh, productivity, its yields uh, in the next 20 years. And you can see in this uh, graphic, if you look at you know, the different places in red, red and, and orange, you can see that you know, uh, you know, uh, California, for example, which is the fifth largest food producer, will also be affected by climate change. You can see that these are problems that you know, uh, don't discriminate you know, anyone. It affects everybody. Um, next. What about healthcare? Same problem. Uh, you can see in this graph, which is quite scary, that by 2025, uh, nearly you know, a fourth of the human population will be suffering from chronic diseases like diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And 70% of the cancer cases will be in the developed world. That means that why water used to be a third world problem that the first world is discovering. Similarly, the first world, the rich man's diseases are being exported to the developed world, okay? So, and again, this is an, uh, another problem with our border that we have to you know, deal with as well. Next. So what does it mean? Well, I think that actually, uh, you know, beyond reverse innovation and all the concept I talked about so far, we need to enter a new kind of, uh, you know, level of thinking and consciousness where we say we are all in the same boat so let's begin to co-create solutions uh, to these problems with our borders. So if we have problems with our borders, we need to create solutions with our borders. Next. That means essentially we get inspiration from ideas from the West, East, North, South. We co-develop them. Next. And then we try to market them you know, globally, right? So we go from the traditional trajectory, which is very linear sequential, to a much more dynamic kind of, you know, trajectory, which is, you know, much more fluid, uh, much more kind of integrated. Next. And I believe that Africa could be the heart of this new, you know, uh, global networks of innovation. Next. And I want to give you an example of that. Uh, this is actually uh, three uh, students uh, from uh, Agro Paris Tech, which is a major engineering school in France, uh, specialized in food sciences. And these kids actually went around Africa and Asia to actually document these frugal solutions in the, you know, in the food sector to find out how can increase ag agricultural productivity without consuming more resources to feed you know, the 9 billion people who will have in the next you know, three decades. And uh, they actually have documented some very interesting uh, solutions in Africa that rely on a combination of uh, traditional knowledge and advanced technologies like mobile phones. And that's where I think that Africa could be, uh, to be very candid, uh, more than other continent in the world, I think could show the world how to come with frugal solutions that combine the past and the future. That means traditions like old techniques of farming combine that with modern technologies that we'll be you know, looking at in the next three days. Next. So as I said, I do believe that Africa can become uh, a global epicenter of uh, these uh, frugal innovation networks. Uh, whereby my dream would be that we have you know, uh, universities and companies both from a uh, developed world, US, Europe, but also from the South, uh, coming to Africa to actually use Africa as a large scale living lab to pilot test frugal solutions that will then find applications anywhere in the world. Next. Next. Yeah, to make this happen, uh, the kind of challenge that I would kind of, you know, issue to you, especially the entrepreneurs in the room, is uh, 
let's raise the bar. I talked about 10x, 10x. Uh, can we come up with a solution from Africa that is 100 times better, right, compared to the existing solutions and using 100x fewer resources? So really set the bar very high in terms of, you know, how, how kind of exponential value you can deliver uh, for, the, for the users while exponentially reducing user resources as well. Next. So the question has been asked, right, is can Africa lead the world innovation? Next. I think that's an irrelevant question. Uh, the real question should be, next. Can Africa engage the world in co-innovation? So the very kind of event that you're attending, Africa for Tech, is actually aimed at engaging and connecting Africa with the rest of the world in a co-innovation partnership. And so I'm very proud to be part of Africa for Tech, and I wish the best of luck to all the entrepreneurs involved in the boot camp the next couple of days. Um, I think you know you can make a huge difference uh, in the world by coming up with frugal solutions that tackle these uh, problems without borders. With that, I'm happy to uh, you know take some questions from, uh, from the audience. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, thank you, Ravi and Julian. I'm I'm gonna uh, help with the questions. I would like. Um, Hi for you to speak a little bit about the concept of, of co-innovation, um, particularly to the majority of our younger innovators in the room, because one of the things that terrifies me is the possibility of a return to colonialism and Africa being used as a source of, um, in the same way that it was once upon a time, a source of uh, uh, mineral extraction and labor extraction and all of this. So how, how can they protect themselves such that um, I innovation doesn't equal neocolonialism? Yes, uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting uh, question. As a matter of fact, uh, if I can be you know, very, very candid with you, I see reverse innovation being a, a form of uh, uh, neocolonialism in the sense that if you look at reverse innovation, essentially it's a solution that, you know, uh, a multinational may have developed in the South, and then they are just taking that intellectual property, right? And then try to create value in other markets. So that's why I think co-innovation is actually a much more kind of equalitarian uh, in spirit than reverse innovation, because uh, the company or entrepreneurs or uh, governments in the South have to take the leadership in engaging the West. That means that you don't ask the West to engage this time, right? By saying, hey, you come, you know, set up an R&D lab in our country and, you know, you do whatever you want and then you can take it back to the West. It should be the other way around. Uh, I think entrepreneurs and companies in the South uh, can organize themselves uh, to actually begin to engage in their own terms the foreign partners. And that means potentially having much more uh, transparency in how intellectual property will be managed because you don't want to do everything in open source. Uh, while I'm a big believer in open source, uh, I do think that you know, uh, certain technologies have to be you know, patented and protected, but all of that has to be done uh, in, you know, in your own terms. Um, and this is where I think that, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm gonna give you a tip on how to do it. Um, it's very important that um, uh, you know, the diaspora, uh, the African diaspora, plays a very important role uh, by becoming what I call an innovation broker. Uh, an innovation broker is a person who has this kind of a biculture. They understand the, the, the needs and aspirations of Africans, but they also spend some time in the West. So they understand the Western mindset uh, and the Western, you know, uh, needs and, uh, and context as well. So co-innovation happens when you have these kind of brokers who are basically uh, you know, uh, familiar with the, both the emerging markets and the mature markets and try to orchestrate a relationship that is fair and equal in, you know, in terms of you know, value creation. Uh, and this is where, uh, you know, this is what happened, for example, um, with India. Uh, you know, and China to some 
an extent where you have many of the, the diaspora members uh, who played a big role in uh, connecting, uh, you know, Indian entrepreneurs with, uh, with the West. Uh, in Indian context, there is something called the Indus Entrepreneurs, uh, TIE acronym, uh, which is made up of a lot of, uh, you know, uh, Indian origin um, uh, venture capitalists and entrepreneurs who are playing a very important role in uh, facilitating co-innovation between uh, Indian entrepreneurs uh, and Western companies in a very kind of, you know, uh, equalitarian way. So similarly, I would think that uh, that is what Africa has to think about is you have the talent, you have the ideas, you have even the technologies, but if you want to go beyond, you know, the African market and think about how can, can we provide global leadership uh, with frugal solutions, uh, you will definitely need to engage more the African diaspora, which will play a crucial role uh, in making these innovation connections, uh, you know, uh, which are mutually beneficial between Africa and the rest of the world. Thank you. Yes, I have another question. Hi, Navi. This is Madan. Thanks again for a good talk. Um, can you talk a little bit about what are the advantages of digital technology for co-innovation? How is digital best suited for co-innovations? Yes, of course. And uh, so, <laughs> I mean, here's the living proof, right? I don't have to physically come to Marrakesh, right, to share my ideas with you. So, so that's a modern, very good question. So digital, and especially for the millennials, is going to play a very important role, which is essentially become a platform for uh, virtual collaboration, right? That means that if you remember the, the, the last graph pic I showed, is that you have these knowledge flows happening across countries. And um, we found that uh, last year, for the first time in, in modern history, uh, they, McKinsey did a study showing that uh, uh, digital knowledge, digital goods, uh, in volume are now being exchanged more across continents than physical goods. So in other words, you know, it's not about iPhones being built in China and then you know, sold around the world now. It's actually about intangible you know, ideas that are being you know, exchanged around the world. So what it means is that um, coming back to the previous question, you can actually think about two things. Um, one is that when you co-create, co-innovate, you can actually engage with uh, partners anywhere in the world uh, using open source, uh, sorry, uh, using digital platform, communication platforms. And uh, particularly you see that in the area of uh, the open source community. Uh, and uh, if you think about things like uh, Raspberry Pi, many of you know that, which is a, you know, a $25 uh, a microprocessor developed in Cambridge, that is an open source hardware. And it's completely co-developed using, you know, people around the world, uh, you know, open source developers. Uh, so you can see that you can co-innovate faster, better, cheaper using digital technologies. And um, if we push that the next level, uh, which is, uh, you know, really even more interesting, is that today we talk about uh, things like 3D printing, right? Uh, 3D printing is for me the, the, the B2C version of, you know, a, a, a bigger revolution is the ability to essentially, you know, make anywhere, right? You can actually, you know, design something somewhere and make it anywhere and sell it anywhere. Um, if that happens, what I see coming up next is these uh, digital factories that can be located anywhere in the world and be interconnected. So you can actually, like, you know, create, you know, a design spec in one place and ship it remotely and have it, you know, prototyped in one place and then scaled up another place. Um, so I think that uh, as the size of manufacturing units are going to get smaller and smaller, uh, we are going to go from uh, you know, large scale, big factories to micro factories. It's already coming up uh, uh, in the space uh, like you know, uh, pharmaceuticals. You can now make drugs in a factory, micro factory, no bigger than a container. And, uh, and this container can be shipped so that if you have like the Ebola case in Sierra Leone, you can actually send the factory on wheels to a location to locally print the drugs. And, and, the, and the design and uh, the formulas can be electronically dispatched. 
right? So this is the kind of amazing innovation I see coming up with the digital tools is both as a collaboration platform, but also as an enabler of the next generation uh, distributed manufacturing. Thank you. Um, other questions? Yes. Okay. Oh, okay. Hello, Navi. Um, Hello. You brought some interesting examples of frugal innovation in um, in agriculture and in, in health. Do you have any examples in, in education and uh, in what's the other topic? Energy <laughs> that you could share with us. Sure. Right. So uh, I think uh, edu education energy. So let me pick on the, on the education side. So I just talked about this, uh, you know, this uh, Raspberry Pi kind of example, right? Which is essentially a microprocessor, uh, which is an open source uh, hardware. And uh, so they are doing something very interesting because you know that uh, 5 billion people worldwide do not have internet access. So they cannot have access to the online education content like you know, Wikipedia or uh, you know, uh, online courses uh, like the MOOCs. Um, so this idea was uh, to take this uh, microprocessor, which is $25, and it has a one uh, gigabyte memory capacity uh, and a one gigahertz uh, uh, processing power. And you can actually download the whole Wikipedia content, uh, content from the Khan Academy, which is an online tutorial on math, science, and engineering. All that goes into this microprocessor. And then this microprocessor can be integrated into a low-cost tablet. Uh, in India, for instance, uh, they have come up with a $30 uh, low-cost tablet called Akash. So inside that, you can put this uh, microprocessor, and suddenly, you have a local server for, for about 50 bucks. For $50, essentially, you have a, a local server, a Wi-Fi you know, server, and then you can have kids in the classroom access you know, offline content from this local server using low-cost tablets. And this is what's happening in some you know, poor uh, you know, villages in India, where suddenly they are not connected to the internet, but they can actually you know, access offline the same educational content. And what's amazing about this, uh, this solution is that uh, when you give the kits, uh, and there was a TED uh, price given to a person who demonstrated that, is that in a classroom, you don't need a teacher. Uh, <laughs> you just send the kit, kits uh, to the children. And the children self-assemble the kits and set up the whole network in about two, three hours, okay, with no help from the outside. Um, so that also shows that essentially, you know, this whole notion of, you know, hiring teachers and you need expensive equipment and, you know, to educate children is nonsense. Uh, the kids actually can self-organize themselves. So I think with technology uh, in education, uh, I see two major uh, important differences, and I think Africa could pioneer that. One is that the learning, the, the learning idea, right, used to be teacher to student, very vertical. The next paradigm is going to be lateral, students learning from each other, right? It's co-learning. So we have to facilitate that, and technology can do that. The second important uh, uh, disruption in education is that we have to go away from learn by you know, theory to learn by doing. And this is where I think that you know, in STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, uh, Africa can leapfrog the West. That is essentially, instead of teaching theoretically math, science, engineering, you can actually think about you know, having a fab lab right, uh, with the 3D printers where the kids can actually go and learn about physics and, uh, and chemistry, whatever, by doing things, right? by making things. Um, so this is where I think that education uh, can be totally reinvented in Africa by uh, introducing a, a new technology-enabled paradigm that promotes lateral co-learning and learn, learning by doing. Uh, and then in energy, um, you know, I think there are several examples that I think uh, Africa is going to pioneer, uh, like MCOPA is one of them. Uh, you saw that Elon Musk just announced, you know, an initiative here, which is all focused on this idea of a microgrid, and uh, you can call it like a distributed generation of electricity. That means that the model I see coming up in Africa is that 
the consumer becomes the producer. We call it the prosumer. That means that the, unlike in the West, where we just consume energy, uh, somebody makes you know in a central grid and is distributed. I think Africa would probably pioneer a more distributed model of uh, you know energy generation uh, using particularly you know solar energy. Um, so I think uh, you know there are some really good examples to learn from Africa in the area of you know uh, both distributed you know uh, energy generation, but also new. Uh, payment models. I think MCOPA is also the notion that you can make micropayments, right, uh, using your mobile phones. So I think it's not just about, uh, you know, in the energy sector, what I see coming up next is not just a way of producing electricity differently, but also a way of a business model uh, in terms of new ways of uh, paying, uh, you know, for electricity as well and clean, and clean electricity. Thank you. Um, do we have a last question? In the audience. Okay. Yes, we have one last question. Um, hi, Navi. My question is more or concern is on education innovation. The example that you just gave, to me, it comes out as eliminating the teacher in the education um, delivery. But the teacher plays a bigger role than just educating. There's, there's so much social impact that can be caused or negative social impact that's caused by um, eliminating the teacher. The teacher uh, would learn the child's behavior, report it to the parents, you know, raise alarms where they should be. So um, with, with, um, with, with um, promoting that we um, eliminate teachers and adapt technology, how do you see that um, affecting the future of children, not only socially, but also in, in the same sphere of education and being um, responsible, smart people if they don't have that guidance of, um, of an adult? Yes. Uh, so I think uh, the example I gave uh, was uh, in India. That's kind of a, a, an extreme example where, you know, basically these are called government schools in India where the teach it's called absenteeism, right? Where the teacher doesn't show up. <laughs> so you have the, the physical building, uh, the kids come, there's no teachers. Uh, so, so that's a very, you know, depressing situation. So that kind of situation, this, this kind of solution, right, helps because, you know, it's better to have uh, you know, a solution like this, then no solution in the case of, you know, uh, these villages in India. But in places where uh, the teachers are available, uh, these technologies can uh, augment their, uh, their contribution. Uh, for example, uh, we see that already um, here in Silicon Valley, there are some interesting initiatives whereby the idea is that the teacher role then is to monitor using technology the individual progress of different students. See, today what we have, and you know that uh, uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, people talking about it, you know, Francois Tadi in Paris and others, that essentially uh, Ken Robinson, right, as you know, is a famous educationist who talks about the fact that today we have an industrial model of education. That is, the teacher essentially has one curriculum and he wants to kind of, you know, impart that on all students without taking into account the individual capabilities and interests of different students. So as I said earlier, what's going to happen in education is that we are going to move from a mass production model, sorry to say that, that's what's going on right now, an industrial model of, you know, learning and education, one fit all, kind of one size fit all kind of model, to a more kind of you know, personalized approach to education. And that's where the, student, the teacher comes in. Because if you can give the tools to students to progress at the O level, you can actually see which students is behind. So maybe the teacher can spend a bit more time, right, uh, and the energy and the time uh, on those particular students who need to play catch up. Uh, and that way, you can make sure that everybody is progressing you know, uh, collectively at the same level. In addition to, as you rightly pointed out, you know, providing other kind of, you know, uh, things like emotional support, uh, you know, uh, career advice and things like that. So the teacher will, role will be still important. What I see happening though, is that in the new model of uh, kind of, you know, lateral learning, uh, I see the teacher becoming more like a, like a facilitator, if you like, of, uh, of the knowledge, uh, you know, uh, uh, access. Uh, rather than, you know, somebody who has a monopoly on knowledge and try to kind of, you know, uh, you know, force all the students, you know, to kind of adopt the same knowledge. Uh, so that means, by the way, 
that uh, if you look at uh, places like Finland, uh, it's a great place to look at. Finland, as you know, scores very high in, uh, you know, in math and science and reading. It, that's because the teachers spend, uh, they get six, seven years of training um, in psychology uh, as well as in, uh, you know, in, in what we call multiple intelligence. That means they are trained to understand how different kids learn differently. <laughs> very different than how the teachers are trained in America or maybe in France, right? So the idea is that the teachers have a lot more empathy, right? Not just intelligence, a lot of empathy for the students. So they know exactly, you know, what is the learning style of different students so they can fine tune, you know, the teaching to suit different students in the classroom. So I think that that's where I see we have to go next is, you know, leverage technology to give more power in a way to teachers, but where they use that power to deliver more personalized attention and guidance to, you know, individual students. And that's a big departure from, you know, the kind of the industrial model of education that we have right now in the West. Well, thank you very much, Navi, for this uh, enlightening inter intervention and, um, and all you just said. Sure. Um, I must say to all you guys uh, from the audience, uh, just to rem remember that Navi cannot see us and, and you should see us uh, at the moment. Everybody is like, wow, <laughs> totally absorbed in what you're saying and it's, uh, it's very interesting. Yeah. So I, I think uh, you deserve a round of applause because thank you very much. <laughs>